Hello, welcome to jasonnewland.com. My name's Jason Newland. This is relaxation hypnosis for stress, anxiety, and panic attacks. Please only listen when you can safely close your eyes. And uh, just to let you know that this podcast is available uh, available available on my website to listen to without the uh, adverts at the beginning and as a continuous play so just go to the website in the menu and you'll see it so you can just press play for the first recording and it will play you all the recordings now, if that doesn't bore you, I have another podcast, which is specifically for boring, called Let Me Bore You to Sleep. So there's, uh, there's a lot of different things, lots of things you can choose from. So I thought, like yesterday, I did a session, like a relaxation session. Um, with and without music and I haven't done one of my little uh, chat I don't know what you want to call them random chats Um, waffling on for a a little while so I thought I'd do one today it's a little bit of uh, bird bird song in the background that you might hear the old uh, pigeons uh, but I quite like it actually. It's not always ideal if I'm making a sleep session. Some people have complained. Someone kill that bloody pigeon, which is a bit annoying. I'm like, no, he's my mate. It's called Fred. So, this is going to be a. I suppose it's a recording to see how you're getting on. How are you? Might seem a bit of a weird question. Might seem a bit weird to listen to a podcast where the person is actually directing a question at you. But yeah, how are you getting on? How are you doing? Because... You may be in a position when no one's asked you that today. You may be in a position when no one's asked you that for a while. And at the date of this recording, practically the whole world is in kind of solitary confinement, you know? So... I think it's quite a, a valid question. How are you doing? How are you getting on? How are you coping with the way things are at the moment? And I realise you can't actually answer me on the recording, so I can't have lots of people saying, well, actually, it's a bit shit. Because it's a bit crappy. For a lot of people. But there are benefits in other ways. So some people are getting paid, they're getting to go home, getting paid 80% of their wages, like my brother is. There's fur, furlough or some weird name. And he's spending that time learning a new thing like studying not everyone has that opportunity and my my sympathies go out to people uh, well to everyone really but s- people that are self-employed you know from a practical perspective 
because you know you don't get sick pay if you're self-employed you don't get holiday pay you don't you know you just earn what you earn and you've got to live on it but I'm not here to talk about that I'm just wondering how you're getting on emotionally how you're dealing with the whole possible overload of negativity that's being squirted at all of us through the television and through the internet through social media through the newspapers the radio maybe through people you speak to on the phone lots of negativity and I personally have times where I struggle to find positivity during positive times so it does sometimes feel that I've got to try and surf the wave that's occurring and I try to do that so if things are going well generally uh, society's feeling quite good for example let's say last year was it last year the World Cup or maybe it was a year before I don't know but the, the World Cup England were doing really well um, didn't win it but we were doing really well at one point and the, the atmosphere just seemed quite nice positivity on the news positivity in the papers positivity around people just I don't know it seemed to have quite a, a positive effect upon society even to those that aren't into football which is what, me I'm not really into football but I like to ride the wave if I can and use that positive energy to do my own things and to sort of get in touch with feeling quite good so when this this big dirty poo flavoured wave that's been like flooding through um, <laughs> lately I'm trying not to ride that wave in fact if anything the main thing I'm trying to do is to get underneath the wave because if it's wavy big waves if you get underneath the wave you dive underneath the water you're less affected by the current of the waves and stuff or if you get out of the water so that's what I've been that's what I've been trying to do lately I've made a few changes and I thought I'd just share that with you just to let you know that you can well I can and maybe you can also gain some positives not out of like because it can seem a little bit uh, I don't know almost rude to sort of the idea of gaining a positive out of such a a worldwide you know pandemic situation but from a personal level maybe there's things you can do that you've put off I don't mean housework or something that you put off because you don't want to do it because it's uh, horrible you know, like laying, it might be like laying carpet or digging the garden. You might have put it off because you just don't want to do it because it doesn't appeal to you. But maybe do something that you've been putting off because perhaps you didn't think that you'd have enough time. Maybe you didn't think that you'd have enough focus or it didn't seem like the right time to do it 
And that could be anything like writing a book or writing a poem, um, singing a song, learning a new instrument. Or maybe learning the instrument that you already own. Like I've got a ukulele. It's still in its box over a year after I bought it. Still up there on the shelf, staring down at me, daring me to play it. One day I might. What about a book? Is a book that you like to read? A book on your shelf that you've thought about reading but you haven't kind of got around to it? On your Kindle maybe? Perhaps there's an online course on Udemy, Udemy, whatever it's called, or something like that. There's loads of online stuff that you can do. Learning something new. Doing some exercise. That might go into the category of things that you really don't want to do because it's crap. But for me, I've got a punch bag in my living room. So I've been doing more exercise. Although I didn't remember being on it yesterday. But um, I'm literally touching it now. It's there. See? That, that's as hard as I can punch it. That's my hardest punch. And there's something quite nice about... It might sound weird, but for me it feels quite nice that my normal lifestyle of a solitary lifestyle is now no longer weird. It's now no longer a life... It's not a... It's not that my brain hasn't forced this upon me. My illness, my... uh, Bipolar, anxiety, personality disorder, whatever, has not forced me to stay indoors most of the time. The government has. I have to stay indoors. It's the law. I'm allowed to go out once a day, maybe. I'm allowed to go to the shop if I need to, once, get a bit exercise, maybe once a day. But the things that I never did before, like socialising, I'm not allowed to do. Which, I feel less of a freak. And I'm not saying that I think that other people that don't socialise or that are like me are freaks. I just sometimes feel like I'm a freak. That's a very different distinction. I think that's fair enough to say. I think we it's understandable I sometimes feel like there's something wrong with me that I should be all excited about seeing other people and I should be interested in other people's lives and I'm not and some of that could have nothing to do at all with mental illness or mental ill health it could just be a personality thing who knows until the mental health system actually realises that everybody that is uh, prescribed medication for a mental health issue needs to have their brain examined literally has you know need to be going into a have a brain scan so they can see neurologists specialists can see what's going on inside the brain then there's more chance of us, us actually getting some help the proper help that we need because it might be a damage part of the brain's damaged due to Who knows, a bang on the head when we were kids. It could be many different things. Or, 
maybe I just don't like being around people very much. Nothing to do with the bipolar, nothing to do with the anxiety. Possibly. I like the idea that maybe not everything is quite as black and white. And when you start looking at things a little bit differently, it breaks it up a bit. It starts to crumble a little bit. And that that limited thinking starts to fall apart. So that thinking of uh, condemning ourselves and putting ourselves down and telling ourselves, oh, I'm this, I'm that. I should be something else. I should be like him or like her. I'm not good enough. That starts to change a little bit. Because actually, that other person is not a perfect specimen of human they're not and the weird thing is if you got a, a it's not weird but someone said to me actually years ago a comedian he said this was quite a it wasn't famous but he was very you know headliner and I think it might have been Alan Davis. He's famous now, but at the time it wasn't. And he said, probably at least 20% of the audience won't like him. Because he wasn't famous, they didn't know who he was. And they just got to a comedy club, I mean, you're there, boring myself. And he said, 20%. 10% probably thinks he's a, just don't like him at all, really dislike him. But because the majority are clapping and laughing, that other little percentage don't even get noticed. So if you've got a crowd of a thousand people, how many of those people do you think have anxiety issues? How many of those people have depression or have got, you know, going through bereavement or have got bipolar or schizophrenia or ADHD or, you know, bulimia? You just go through a list, a list of uh, different illnesses. It's just a huge list. So out of that thousand people, there's going to be a lot of people there that if you knew what was actually going on in their own mind and in their life, you could separate people and you could say, wow, there's really that many. And then you could look at the people that have not admitted to it the people that have not ever gone to a doctor, not ever been prescribed medication, never gone through that process. And if you could actually give them a truth serum to be honest about how they feel, then you start to be able to divide that group up between the ones that were lying and the ones that perhaps a, you know genuinely don't have any problems which is I'd say pretty much no one we've all got our problems so even those ones that don't admit to having anxiety there's going to be some that do but they might not know that it's anxiety I had stress for years without knowing it was stress I had anxiety didn't know it was anxiety I had mood swings. How how could you have mood swings and not know that you're having mood swings? I didn't know. I didn't know what it was. All I knew is sometimes I'd love you, sometimes I'd hate you, 
and that could change. It could change daily, it could change in an instant, and it could turn back again. Sometimes I feel wonderful about the world. I could dance at a funeral. I'd be really happy. Not because of the funeral, because that's how I was feeling. But at a wedding, I could feel the lowest that you know I could feel. I knew that it weren't right, but I didn't know what to do about it. I wasn't a psychiatrist, a psychologist, no medical training, no psychology training at that point. I have now, not medical training, but I have trained in uh, mental health and I wonder how many other people out there in the world have got no clue that what they're going through is actually it's an illness. Yet they may be mocking other people, putting down other people, criticising other people for being ill. I mean, the, the other day, two days ago, I was listening to an interview and Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, has been in intensive care um, with the coronavirus. And one of his close friends was on the radio uh, saying, tell, talking about him and saying, Boris is really annoyed being in hospital because... He sees illness as weakness. Well, that's a great quality for a Prime Minister, isn't it? To see ill people as being weak. I got so angry. Honestly, I nearly, I nearly threw my bowl of cornflakes against the wall. Then I remembered that I'm greedy, so I had to eat them. Illness as weakness. So if he sees that in himself, he may well see that in other people. He might not, though. But he's a conservative prime minister. They're not, you know, I'm not going to get political, but they're not, they're not famous for being kind towards disabled people, for example of which I am one and of which you may be one because disability isn't just physical and like so many of my recordings I could go off on a tangent but I try not to I try not to the really question read the really question the real question was how are you getting on? I want to keep it light hearted. How are you doing? These are difficult times for a lot of people. There's a lot of people that are on their own and they don't want to be on their own. I'm not one of those people. It doesn't mean I don't care about people that, you know, that want to be around other people. I mean, for me, one of the best parts of this is opening the front door and not allowing anyone in because I'm not allowed to instead of pretending not to be here <laughs> or um, letting people in and just waiting for them to leave. So for me, there's benefits. There might be benefits for you. It might be a completely different thing. But when I say benefits, I'm not talking about benefits of an illness that's spreading, that people are getting ill. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about benefits of people suffering. I'm not. What I'm talking about is the personal benefits that you might be able to tap into 
whether it's a chance to watch a box set on Amazon or Netflix and it gives you an opportunity to watch all the Harry Potter films again whatever that thing might be maybe you decide you're going to listen to every single episode of my Let Me Bore You To Sleep and then it's over 400 hours so you might think oh listen to all that 400 hours worth now you'd have to be really bored to do to even start that one but what can you do to actually make the most of the time the most important thing is you keep safe but also positivity strengthens our immune system positive thinking I'm not talking like fake positive thinking I'm talking about real positive thinking you know it's not sort of oh it's raining what is it the, I think a standard one would be someone moans it's raining yeah but the ducks are happy Ooh. like yeah but I'm not I don't want it to rain it, so I think sometimes positivity can be um, just being incongruous with the person that you're talking to so if someone's feeling um, I think an example my dad <laughs> bless him one of his like, lovely little sayings is that's not a problem but he likes to say it after I've just told him something that's a problem you know oh I've uh, I haven't got a, I've uh, what's it oh the hours are being cut down on my counselling work is one of the things so I'm not sure what's going to happen there I might end up with problems paying the rent that's not a problem well it clearly is I just told you it's a problem it's not a problem it's there's a positivity to have that idea of it's not a problem we can find a solution we can get through this let's move forward but sometimes I think it needs to be in your own head rather than to tell other people that actually what they're worried about isn't something for them to worry about because it's not really down to us to tell someone else that is it it's not our place to tell someone else what they can or cannot be concerned about in life. What's next? You know, tell people what they're allowed to eat, what they should think. So, you know, it's not really... <laughs> I have issues with my papa. <laughs> so, how are you doing? It might seem like I'm just asking the same question over and over again. And I am. Because it gives me a chance to think about what I'm going to say next. So you could think this is a recording. It's like a catch-up. It's like, uh, hello, how you doing? How you getting on? How you been? Did you enjoy the relaxation session I did yesterday? I thought it was quite good, actually. But it's not just that. It's about the seclusion. One thing that I've noticed, and I didn't expect this, is even though I prefer... 95% of the time to be on my own once I was told I had to be on my own I didn't like it. it pissed me off genuinely what do you mean I can't I wanted to start knocking on strangers doors and talking to them I wanted to talk to neighbours even though I don't want to do that normally it annoyed me being told what I can and can't do 
and I think that might be and it goes against the western world I think I'm not saying it goes against it doesn't go against any other countries but I don't know enough about other countries but I know that some countries in the world discipline authoritarianism um, is ingrained in the general public but here it's not we've in England, I mean, we, we are supposed supposed to do what we're told, and that you know, by the law. But it's an option. You're not allowed to shoplift, but you can shoplift. But you'll get arrested, and you could go to prison, or you get a you know prison record. But you're not allowed to, but you can. You know, it's a choice. There's no physical barrier. There's no ingrained. Um, I suppose unless it's a religious way you know you should not steal and that was something that was used wasn't it to try and get people to behave in the past doesn't seem to work these days so the idea of being told you've got to stay in I'm looking around where I live not everyone's doing it. I saw one person and I was walking Andre, I was going to the garage to get some food on my own, no one around me. And this person I said, uh, and he was standing really close to another friend of mine, I said, You need to keep your distance, mate. He said, What you think? I've got it, have you, dear? He was giving it a big one. You think, I've got it. I said, You don't know if you've got it. That's the point. It's not something you don't you don't sort of suddenly grow a third nipple, you know, as a sign. You don't start farting out of your mouth. You know, it's it's <laughs> there's no obvious thing. I know I've got it because I've got a got a big head growing out of my knee. It's like no, that doesn't no. There's no way of knowing until the symptoms come. Again, I don't want to get into all that side of things, but I realise that there's a lot of people like that person. They're going from house to house to house without any kind of logic in their brain or intelligence, potentially. Just for that thing, they might be the most intelligent person in the world but just for that particular thing. And in society, we've got a lot of people that don't live by, they feel the laws above them, in, or below them rather, they feel that they're above the law, and the law doesn't apply to them in normal times. So why are they gonna follow the rules now? It's a, you know, it's a weird one. It's a strange one. One of the benefits we've got is we've got the technology to communicate with other people. The internet, telephones, you know, we've always had telephones for a long time, haven't we? But the internet. So you don't have to be on your own. I mean, sometimes I go on Facebook and I read other people's posts and it just makes me feel glad that I haven't got anyone in my flat talking to me. You know, I rarely see a post on Facebook where I think, I'd like to hear more about that. You know, sometimes I do, but you know, occasionally there's a lot of moaning on uh, social media, I find sometimes. Not none of my friends on Facebook because they're all lovely for any of those that are listening, but other people's Facebook pages <laughs> and Twitter. 
<laughs> so I just realise I'm just I'm not slagging anyone off I'm just saying I think they're all wonderful and when I was walking home from the garage earlier just got a bit of food for the next few days and I was walking back to my flat and I just felt so grateful that I wasn't living with anyone the idea of being cooped up with another person for weeks and weeks and weeks I just feel grateful that I'm not and although you know being in a relationship marriage or whatever is supposedly what we should all be doing according to societal rules or whatever or at least when I grew up that was what the rules were there's something quite nice about being single during this time I suppose that one of the benefits of being with someone would be to be able to focus on them rather than focusing on myself so maybe a little it might raise some compassion, a bit of empathy, possibly. But it'd be, I think it's quite nice not to have that. Not compassion or empathy, but to have someone there all the time. Because I don't, even on the best days, I, for someone I really like, I've got about an hour I've got an, a good hour in me to converse with them and then it's just sort of like for me it just fades out it's like you can go now but you can't tell someone though can you you can't just say yeah I'm bored now can you can you leave can you I don't want to talk anymore so that's the thing about being honest we can't always be honest can we which is a bit of a, it's good and it's bad I mean it's it's good because I don't want to be rude to anyone but sometimes it'd be nice to be to be able to just say oh, your hours up that's why I like counselling being a client and being a counsellor because it was a 50 minute hour and the rules are it ends at 50 minutes and the person goes away or I leave you know whichever seat I'm sitting in and that 50 minutes can be really a great hour can be a really good conversation worthwhile uh, with valuable content now if you expand that to five hours it's diluted into kind of just a puddle I mean I'm not you know I'm not saying all relationships are just like a dirty puddle but I can just talk from my own perspective So there are benefits, possibly, of self-isolation. The one I would say is, don't feel guilty. Don't feel guilty for being in. Don't feel guilty for sleeping when I want to go to sleep. Don't feel guilty for sleeping when it's sunny outside. No, why should I feel guilty? I've got to be indoors. I'm allowed to go outside, but only to the shops or maybe for a walk once a day but I can't go to the park I can't you know go into town and like wander around and all the things I wouldn't really want to do anyway so I like the idea of not feeling guilty for a little while because being on benefits I feel a bit guilty for that 
should be working. There's always that in my mind. I worked most of my adult life until the last five years. But I should be working. That goes in my mind. Should should be at work. Should be doing something. Even if, even if it's something horrible that I hate doing. And I spent years doing horrible jobs. But that's 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 better than that's better for me than to not do anything or than to be unemployed but then I'm not not doing anything because I'm doing this so I think uh, that's how I see it anyway I'm contributing not to the local area but to the wider world only like 15 people around the world but at least it's a few it's a few people 15 is a nice number so I don't feel guilty about that at the moment maybe I will again when this whole stuff is over and everything goes back to normal and uh, the unemployed and the sick uh, going back to being the enemy of the state the disabled will go back to being despised like they were before all this happened looked down upon by the working the working people and the government not all working people obviously but a lot of people out there not very sympathetic to disabilities and I didn't used to be I do understand it I didn't used to be I couldn't have cared at all when I was in my 20s could not have cared about anybody's mental disabilities didn't care wasn't interested Why, why you should work I have to work therefore you should have to work that was my mentality even though I was going through my own mental health issues continuously for since I was a child but I didn't see it as that I just saw it as this is how I am I suppose a part of me would think, well, if I can get out of bed when all I want to do is just literally just not even be alive, but if I can still get out of bed and go to work, then everyone else should be able to do that. That used to be the mentality. If I can stand there, keep quiet, and do my job, when all I want to do is smash the crap out of the person sitting next to me or standing next to me. If I, you know, it's like in a, if, if all I want to do is get the computer and just smash it over the supervisor's head. That was sometimes how I felt, but I didn't do it. And I felt that everyone else should be able to control their tempers and keep themselves calm and relaxed even if they weren't inside I had no sympathy no empathy no compassion for anybody with mental health issues or disabilities I don't feel that way anymore and I haven't done for a long time that's why I know that people change that's why I think it's it's good to never give up on people, especially on ourselves, because we will change. We have to, we've got no choice, and life will change things. I'm sure there's people that had no sympathy for someone that was in a wheelchair and then they've ended up in a wheelchair themselves 
and now they can, you know, they've had no choice but to have empathy with other people in that situation, but they just couldn't, couldn't even think about it. It just was too, too fantasy. You know, it wasn't something that even seemed like it could possibly happen. So how are you doing? See, I keep coming back to it. Even though the rest of the stuff between the how are you has nothing to do with the how are you, maybe. But maybe it does. I like to think it all comes together eventually. Like a really, really bad movie. At the end, everything comes together. Oh, that's what it was about. So perhaps, like me, you can, you, you might have felt guilty in the past, not because there's a reason to feel guilty, but perhaps because of society, because of the way you've been treated in the past. Uh, even for me, when I was working in a charity, a charity for children or young people. I was a counsellor there, so it wasn't that long ago, 2011. I've been a counsellor since 2010. And I'm not there anymore. And I was working in the reception of this children's charity, just part time because they liked me. So they gave me a part-time job after I finished college and I was working as a counsellor so I was just about earning enough to get by. Started going through depression and the manager said to me, what's going on with you? Because I was, I was moody and I said, look, I'm just going through basically there had been a lot of stuff had happened in a short time a girlfriend split up with a girlfriend who I just started a relationship with but I don't know what happened but it just didn't, didn't work out I got evicted from my home that I'd been in for over three years um, some other stuff as well so it was very difficult time and I said to her I'm depressed I'm depressed. I'm going through depression. And what she said to me is, have you, have you considered killing yourself? That's what she said to me. She found that funny. This is the manager of a charity which offers counselling. They offer other things as well. But a big part of it is offering counselling to people that are you know, potentially suicidal and many other issues. So she was trying to bully me, and I left. So that doesn't necessarily fit in with the guilt part, only in the sense of even people that should know better. I don't know why I'm laughing because it's not funny, but they should really know better. Don't always even people that should really be in the know. I mean, I try not to use the word should, but if you're managing a charity that deals with vulnerable people with mental health issues, you kind of, the word should, I think, is valid for be aware of people's, of mental illness and possible vulnerabilities, not just to the clients, but also to the staff. And everyone there was scared of her. No one would do anything. So I just left. Uh, 
And I wonder, imagine having someone like that as a family member. Imagine being that person's child and having depression and having that attitude. You know, her child going to her and saying, oh, I've got this. What have you thought about killing yourself? I'm sure it wouldn't happen. I'm sure that that person wouldn't say that to someone that they cared about. And, you know, I used to have a kind of similar attitude to that when I was younger. I've never been in a position of authority. I've never been anyone's manager. I've managed people a little bit when I was in insurance, but only as far as... uh, looking after them and coaching them a little bit but not, you know, maybe sort of supervisor temporary while one of the supervisors is on holiday and stuff in the past but I've never had any responsibility over an employee never had any kids, never been married I've never been in a position to control another person or to have any kind of significance to another person so that what I said would actually mean a huge amount to that other person. Because that's a huge responsibility. And I'm so glad I didn't have that because back in the past, honestly, I may not have been much use, you know, in my 20s, early 20s, I like to think that I wouldn't have been awful, but I was a bit chaotic. But then I think things like empathy, compassion, caring is something that perhaps needs to be taught by the people that are living with you. You know, right from an early age. And not everybody gets that, do they? Not everyone has that opportunity to experience nice people. So maybe that's why I'm doing this now. Maybe not this particular recording, but trying to make up for my my crappy attitude when I was younger but you know there was no one to help me and this isn't going to be for everyone it's not going to no one's not everybody's going to want to listen to some random person just yabbering on some some will find it fairly okay, some will think it's good, some will think it's, what the heck? But I would have liked to have had someone... like me not exactly me but someone sort of similar to listen to when I was a younger man maybe in my teens early 20s because then I start to think maybe oh wait a minute these mood swings this anxiety or these feelings maybe that's what it is Perhaps I can read up more on this. Or maybe I'll do that technique with the rolled up sock 
Um, I should explain this so that people who don't know what it is in case you think I'm being rude. It's a rolled up sock and you just, you just basically chuck it to each, each hand to activate both sides of the brain and it calms you down. So just a simple, a simple thing like that. There's lots of different things that I'm going to be not necessarily introducing, but introducing to this podcast. I mean, not necessarily anything that I've ever said or done is unique in any way. I kind of feel in some ways that no one can own words. No one, you know, no one can own a sentence. I know you can legally copyright books and say, well, I've written this, written this sentence and, you know, I can write a paragraph and put it into Google and nothing will come up. So I can say, well, that's mine. Because if it is written in a book somewhere, it's probably going to come up in a Google search. It's just a bunch of words and ideas. And I'm not really big on like owning those. An idea is an idea. If you take that idea and it then becomes your idea. And your I your experience of that idea will be different to my experience. So you might hear me say, well, um, if you think about it, well, there's people that you see in the street, at least 50% of those people you see in the street or in a supermarket are going to have, um, possibly have mental health issues of some kind or have done in the past. You might take that on and actually... It might change your perception to a point where you don't feel so isolated. And I'm not talking about isolation in the you know the current circumstances, but you don't feel so alone, don't feel like a weirdo or like, oh I'm not, it's only me, there's no one else who's going through this. When actually there's millions and millions and millions of people that are going through this, whatever this is, but they're going through their own version of that. It's different for everyone. We don't experience it the same. It's just different. And I think a lot of people a lot of people that I've sort of spoke to over the years, I, you know, sort of struggle with that idea that we're different. I noticed, and I, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm generalizing, but over the years I've noticed that sometimes when people talk, they assume that other people think and feel the way that they do and they're incorrect but maybe there's a comfort in that the idea that we feel that other people think and feel exactly the same as we do maybe there's comfort in that there's also comfort, I think, in uniqueness. And the idea that actually we can't read other people's minds and other people can't read our minds. And you may say, well, we know that. A lot of people don't know that. They actually think that they can tell what someone's thinking by the expression on their face or by their bodily movements or by their posture or by their voice tone 
they don't know what the other person's thinking by that. And the only way you could ever get close to knowing, really, is if you get to know someone intimately. You know, if you're sort of married to someone, or you've raised a child, or a parent, someone that you spent many, many, many hours and days and weeks and years with, then you might be able to guess. It's still going to be a guess. There's no way of knowing. You can't know. You could say, oh, you're, you're cross, aren't you? You're angry. Never used the word cross, but some people do. You're angry. Why? And you could say, yeah. And I could say, you're angry because... You're angry because I tipped the, the bin, the kitchen bin, all over the floor and kicked all the the rubbish all over the place and poured yoghurt all over the microwave. It's a guess. She, She might not be angry about that. It's a guess. She might say, she might say, yeah, I'm angry about that. She might not be. She might not be. She might be angry about the fire I started in her car. And she could, you know, it could be anything. Why did I set a big, a big tent up in the living room? You know, it could be. So you don't always know why someone is angry or what they're feeling. And they might agree with you, say that's it. But they might be lying. So we don't ever really know. It doesn't really matter. Because if you say, are you okay, and another person says yes, there's only so much we can do. If they don't tell you, how are you supposed to know? So, another reason not to feel guilty. See, I've got lots of reasons not to feel guilty, because I don't, I'm not a big fan of guilt met too many people that like guilt like to put guilt on other people love to blame there's a lot of blaming going on and I've done my fair share can't be bothered with it anymore not blaming or being blamed not a fan it's boring now that's one of the benefits of getting to be an old fogey like me an old age pensioner nearly nearly 50 be 50 in 2 months 3 months 4 months May, June, July yeah 4 months time will be 50 so presents would be grateful lots and lots of birthday cards thank you very much so I'm going to go this has been a little just random a random thing but I think the important thing is to look after yourself but also take that pressure off yourself if you can and that's why I've been talking about guilt a little bit it's just what is there to feel guilty about anyway in normal times but these are not normal times for those not listening or for those listening in the future like in a year's time or 20 years time just google like if google's still around but just you look up 2020 uh, you know April 2020 and you'll see what's going on and then you'll see May and everything's fine so that's good so let that guilt go and the question you could ask is if you've got guilt um, about your lifestyle you know are you hurting anyone if you're not then let it go and if you are hurting someone then it's it's something you need to look into perhaps and of course that could mean different things to different people but you need to look after yourself 
and these times this is probably going to sound a little bit rude I don't mean it in a rude way or not rude but I'm thinking that perhaps and I might have said this previously I do make a lot of recordings so I might have said this before and I'm really you know sad that this has happened the whole thing and sad that a lot of people will be going through mental ill health anxiety stress possibly for the first time or a recurrence of previous stuff or fresh anxiety financial uh, relationship job difficulties all that stuff as well as bereavement as well of course but out of all those people some there's going to be a lot of new more compassionate people arising that can actually have a grasp of what it feels like to have mental health issues and know that it's not just being lazy it's not just feeling a bit down or feeling a bit moody or we all have moods that's what I've been told we all have moods don't we yeah yeah we do it's true we do do all have moods we all have moods when's the last time that you stayed in bed all week and you couldn't get up and you literally nearly shat the bed because you couldn't get out of bed you didn't eat you only ate because your stomach was hurting so bad that you had to eat and you felt ill and dizzy and sick so you had to force yourself to get out of bed and eat the person would probably say well no I'm never that down you know I get down but perhaps not that sounds a bit, a bit worse than just being down so you have mood swings yeah when's the last time you went and spent every single penny that you've got on something that you didn't even want and then you destroyed it. Not many people do that. That have a good moment. That haven't, you know, that are on a having a good day. But there's a lot of people with bipolar that would maybe do that. I know someone that actually went out, bought a boat, bought a boat, spent all the money that he had. And he was probably in his 60s when he did this. So his whole life savings. Bought a boat, set fire to it. <laughs> Just that, and he said it was the best fun he's ever had. Even afterwards. He was sectioned and everything like that afterwards. But even like a few years later, he said to me, it was so much fun. being in a good mood is not something that would lead to that so we all had moods no there's a difference I've never done anything like set fire to a boat but then I've never had enough money to buy a boat so <laughs> but I still don't think I'd do something like that but I've done some silly things over the years very destructive things usually aimed at myself So, you know, anxiety-wise, oh, we all feel a bit anxious sometimes, don't we? Yeah, so when's the last time that you couldn't go to a family, you know, really, really important family occasion because of your anxiety? And a member of your family that was really close to you no longer really talks to you anymore because of it. So they've never forgiven you. I've had that in fact I've had it twice with the same person <laughs> which is funny well not funny but it's uh, 
it's a bit of lack of compassion on their side I think and a lack of uh, explanation on mine when's the last time some an average person who has oh we yeah, all have anxiety so how often you know how much do they avoid in their life realistically and there's a lot of that isn't there I think the public saying stuff like well I must have a bit of an eating disorder because uh, I can't stop eating chocolate I'm like well, no <laughs> it's not that's not you know it could be it could lead to that and it could be an eating disorder it depends how much if you're binging huge and huge amounts of food every day at three o'clock in the morning when there's no one around to see you do it and you weigh 26 stone yet the rest of the time you're a vegan and you eat basically just cabbage and lettuce and you know really low calorie food and no one understands why you're 26 stone when you eat practically nothing but actually at three o'clock in the morning when there's no one around you empty the entire fridge down your, down your throat. That's an eating disorder. As well as many other types. But some people don't realise that. Oh, I've got... It's kind of almost a... Dismissing. Just dismissing it. Dismissing someone's real issue. I mean, it's the equivalent of just calling someone in a wheelchair lazy, isn't it? Really. You wouldn't go up to someone in a wheelchair and say, I know how you feel. I often need to sit down. I sit down myself sometimes. I just can't be bothered to walk around. You wouldn't. So why do people think it's okay to say, well, we all have moods. I'm feeling a bit depressed today. I don't really feel like going to work today. I think I'll phone in and I'll just watch television and go on Facebook and speak to my friends, maybe go to the park. I'm not dismissing their feelings because that could be depression. But it could just be just a really crap day, just a real a feeling but it's not depression it's a low day or it could be depression so you know it's, who knows <laughs> so you know it's uh, so 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 that is it I think I think I've talked enough who'd have thought I'd ever stop talking me eh? I have so get rid of the guilt look after yourself and be kind to yourself because you deserve to be happy lots of love bye